Welcome back to American History 2. Um, in this section, we're going to be looking at a movement for reform that is in many ways a reaction uh, to the problems of urbanization as well as the excesses of industrialization. Uh, we call this reform movement progressivism, but it's been notoriously difficult to define. Um, at the very least, we can say that progressives as a whole uh, wanted to do something to address the problems of industrialization and to address the issues that came with urbanization as well. Uh, but beyond that, it's fairly difficult to define them as a movement. Uh, some of the uh, reforms that the progressives addressed, uh, students probably will find needful and quite helpful. Uh, but other things progressives tended to want to do um, seem to be a little less savory. Uh, so beyond being largely a group of middle class people, uh, many of them coming from those streetcar suburbs we saw uh, in the earlier presentation, and wanting to do something to address the excesses of urbanization and industrialization. Beyond that, there's very little that holds them together as a group, and as a result as well, um, historians are continually divided over the nature of progressivism as well. Um, some historians look at progressive reform as net positive and tend to present progressives uh, quite glowingly, and other historians tend to have a much more negative impression about the impact and significance of the progressive movement. And by the end of this section, you'll get a sense as to why that might be the case. Progressivism as a sort of social movement is hard to pin down to any specific date range. Um, it's a feeling, a sentiment amongst middle class people that stems from the late 19th century um, and continues on to the early 1920s when we tend to shift towards a sort of reaction against the uh, progressive movement. But uh, um, some of the earliest progressives include women like uh, Jane Addams. Uh, Jane Addams looked at her own life, uh, reflected on her education, and thought this sort of Victorian middle-class standard just did not suit her, uh, that she had worked really hard to improve herself, and she just didn't see her spending, uh, see herself spending her remaining days uh, raising a family and isolated in her own suburban household. Um, so instead, she decided she was going to do something about some of these immense challenges of her time, uh, like urban poverty. Uh, in Chicago, uh, she became famous for founding um, a, a building called Hull House, uh, which really inspired and motivated this broader settlement house movement. Um, Hull House, like other settlement houses, uh, was intended to be a, a, uh, um, an aid uh, to the working class residents who lived around it. Um, it. Hull House provided all sorts of services to the people who lived around it. Um, legal assistance, uh, assistance for union organizing, job education, child care services. Uh, the goal of Hull House, as described by Jane Addams, was to be um, um, uh, adaptive, uh, to meet the needs of the people around them as they popped up. Um, and the success and national renown of Hull House inspired a bunch of other settlement houses in other cities around the country. So Jane Addams and other women like her uh, were taking an active role in addressing some of the problems of urban reform. And for Jane Addams, that meant that she them herself had to get involved, that the problem of urban poverty, um, urban... Um, disease, urban misery, uh, called her to do something personally about it and to be a participant in trying to fix these problems. Um, other women uh, followed through on that similar example of crossing this boundary between the private realm to which in, uh, Victorian women were supposed to be confined and moving ever more into a more public realm. Um, some of them got involved in politics. Um, not necessarily running for office themselves, but as you can see on the slide in front of you, Catherine Davis uh, becomes a, a bureaucrat, a civil servant um, in the city of New York. Um, other women got involved in political advocacy, like uh, Margaret Sanger, um, who in the 19-teens becomes an advocate for birth control access. Um, and her lobbying, her endorsement for access to birth control eventually is going to inspire this movement that uh, leads to the creation of uh, Planned Parenthood um, later in the 20th century. 
And as a result, it's not too far from the imagination to think that some of these women who are bridging this boundary between the private home sphere and moving ever more into a more public realm um, are going to think that perhaps women ought to be involved in politics directly um, as voters and as elected politicians. Um, you can see on the map in front of you here that the National Amendment to the Constitution, uh, recognizing the right of women to vote, does not come until 1920. Uh, but as you can see, there were a number of states that prior to 1920 had recognized the right of women to vote. Uh, most of the earliest of these states were in the West. Uh, states like Wyoming and Utah were real leaders in recognizing the right of women to vote. Um, the map in front of you also gives you some sense of the complexity of women's rights. Uh, the states in orange uh, tended to have full suffrage. Women could vote in elections and run for office. Uh, the states in blue had no um, recognition of women's right to vote. Uh, but some of the other states' colors recognized the right of women to vote in local municipal elections or just in the presidential election. Um, but all that is to say that the women's suffrage movement was born out of this struggle on the part of women to do something about the excesses of the urban landscape and the problems of industrialization. Now, many of these women uh, who were involved in women's suffrage uh, came from the middle class. And here is where we tend to see the limits of women's suffrage as a women's movement. Uh, many of these middle-class women generally regarded themselves as the leader of the movement. Uh, they thought they had the education and the social grace to be able to take on a public role themselves. And sometimes this tended to clash with women from other classes. Uh, one woman in particular, Margaret Foley, found that the middle-class perspectives and assumptions of her fellow suffragettes uh, meant that they saw a very limited role for her once women's suffrage was recognized in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, Margaret Foley, leading up to 1920, had long been an advocate for labor reform. Uh, she had been involved in a number of labor movements, uh, pressing for uh, better wages, better working conditions for uh, female garment workers. Um, she was known as being a great public speaker. Um, she would occasionally get hecklers from the audience, particularly men who would uh, uh, deny her right or her power to be able to uh, stand up in front of an audience and give a public address. Um, she was very good at drowning them out. Uh, so being a labor organizer, being a great public speaker, uh, she would be forgiven for thinking that when 1920 arrived and Massachusetts now had the right for women to vote, that maybe she ought to run for public office. But her former middle-class suffragette allies said, well, you're Irish, you have something of an accent that's going to limit your ability to win public office. Uh, she was also Catholic, which many of her middle-class allies thought was also going to be a limitation. Uh, so Margaret Foley herself found herself quite disappointed. Um, she eventually gets into bureaucratic positions in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, but this was largely the result of her alliances with male Democratic allies. Um, who helped her get these positions and not her female allies within the suffrage movement. So all of that is to say, as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, lecture series, that when we look at the progressive era, it's easy to look at it and look at all the positive things that the progressives accomplished and to ignore some of the darker negative sides of the progressive era um, and some of the limitations of, of what they were trying to accomplish. That at the end of the day, yes, they're a reform movement trying to deal with some of the problems, some of the misery created by industrialization and urbanization. But at the same time, it's hard to separate the progressive movement from those middle-class standards that many of its participants tended to have. Um, also making it complicated is that there were lots of progressives, and of course, anytime you have an organization that includes, or a social movement that includes lots of different people, uh, you're going to have lots of different opinions. Um, and so progressives were not always themselves of one mind regarding um, what to do. Uh, when it comes to Margaret Sanger, for example, uh, many middle-class women were shocked at the kinds of things Margaret Sanger was promoting. Um, her journal that she regularly published was eventually declared to be obscene literature and was not allowed to be published uh, prior to her return in, in 1916 when she came back to the United States from Great Britain. Um, there was a, a rather famous political cartoon of Margaret Sanger depicted as a demon uh, advocating for uh, uh, this, this billboard that says free love on it. And uh, in the background is this woman saddled with a drunkard husband 
um, who has um, forced upon her a number of children. And the idea was that she was offering a false promise, that, uh, that this idea of contraception is allowing women to carve out um, the free exercise of their sexuality, but uh, her opponents argued that this was a false promise. So on the one hand, you have progressives who are advocates of the temperance movement who would have looked at that political cartoon of Margaret Sanger and said, yes, Margaret Sanger is a false prophet. On the other hand, you had other advocates for rational reform who would argue that Margaret Sanger had some good ideas and should have been listened to. So uh, anyway, all that is to say that progressives are hard to pin down as a group, and they're also hard to pin down on whether they were a net positive or a net negative for uh, the American people. Another person who tends to be a fairly polarizing individual is the person depicted on the slide here, uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor. Um, he's sometimes described as the uh, first <clears throat> advocate for rationalized management. Um, he writes this book about uh, how to organize labor, um, and he writes against laborers themselves controlling their own labor. Um, he particularly resents what laborers called soldiering. Um, laborers had this idea, uh, in many places, that uh, there was a sort of limited amount of, of resources available. Um, and so if one worker worked, I, don't, I guess, too hard, uh, produced too quickly, then this would mean that other workers couldn't get a job. Um, and so Frederick Winslow Taylor just absolutely hated this idea that sometimes laborers actually intentionally tried to limit their own production to benefit their peers. Um, he pushed for a number of policies, including policies that advocated for anti-soldiering policies, so no more trying to limit your own production. Uh, but also, you can see on the slide in front of you, he, he looked rationally at the way labor was being performed and said there's got to be a best practice, a best way to do everything. Um, and it would go down to even things like shovels. Um, and Taylor asked, what is the best shovel to use for shoveling soil or for rocks or for coal? And what he found was that basically a shovel that is able to hold about 21 and a half pounds worth of stuff is the right kind of shovel. Uh, so that meant whatever kind of shovel you needed to shovel 21 and a half pounds worth of dirt, that was the shovel you should use, et cetera, for coal and for rocks. Uh, now, on the one hand, like I said, for many, he's seen as the father of modern management, providing a sort of rational uh, process for managing workers. On the other hand, sometimes he's seen as dominating, uh, depriving workers of control over their own labor, um, insisting that management be able to uh, control everything down to the very kinds of shovels that soldiers used, uh, depriving workers of the means that they had previously used to try and negotiate for better conditions for themselves, things like depriving management of their labor. Uh, Taylor was a strong opponent of that. So anyway, Taylor himself, like other progressives, tended to embody the mixed messages of the period. On the one hand, offering this idea that the kind of, of chaos of urbanization and industrialization ought to be controlled and ought to be rationalized. Uh, sometimes we see that as a good thing, but sometimes it can be seen as a bad thing as well. <clears throat> On the slide in front of you is another uh, person who identified as a progressive uh, and became an advocate for the eugenics movement within the United States. Um, he wrote this book, uh, The Passing of the Great Race, uh, which was designed as a book advocating for immigration reform. Uh, Grant worried about particularly the inundation of the United States uh, by millions of immigrants, particularly coming from uh, Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, and said that this was a threat to the American race. Um, eugenics was a movement steeped in a sort of pseudoscience. Um, it was a, a, a racialized understanding of the way human populations developed. And eugenics tended to um, develop its racist principles first and then try to nitpick evidence to support that in the sort of scientific uh, community. Um, eugenics, eugenicists like uh, Madison Grant um, eventually advocated for forced sterilization campaigns. Uh, several states are going to create sterilization campaigns to uh, sterilize criminals uh, those deemed to be mentally unfit. Uh, Grant was concerned that immigration into the United States was going to dilute the racial purity of American uh, people themselves. Um, it's kind of shocking to see today, but uh, state fairs um, that we have today uh, that tend to show 
you know, the best pig or the best cow. Uh, well, one of the categories for, uh, you know, the best at some of the state and county fairs in the early 20th century uh, were best human babies. Um, unsurprisingly, these babies tended to be white. They tended to exhibit uh, racial characteristics that were seen as the best, uh, most fit for human breeding. Um, those ideas have fallen by the wayside today. It will not surprise you either uh, to understand that some of the ideas of the eugenics movement in the United States are going to inspire uh, the kind of, of racial sterilization programs and uh, racial um, um, uh, nation-building programs that are going to be used in Nazi Germany uh, during the 1930s and 40s. Uh, so, again, progressives tended to want to rationalize things uh, they looked to science to try and fix what they saw as the um, chaos of urban America, the problems of industrialization. Uh, sometimes we'll look at those reforms and say, that was probably a good thing, that probably made the lives of workers better, but when it comes to people like Madison Grant, uh, we can look at that and say, well, yes, he's a progressive, yes, he is wanting to rationalize something here, but we can see that the policies he's advocating were quite monstrous. Um, and eventually, in fact, the ideas of Grant and others like him are going to uh, inspire anti-immigration crusades, which are really going to shape immigration in the United States in the 1920s. Uh, when you look at immigration into the U.S., it reached a sort of peak in the, in, up to and including 1917, when the U.S. enters World War I. Um, but immigration in the U.S. never picks up again once World War I is over, and in part that's because of the uh, anti immigrant-inspired, anti-black-inspired policies of people like Madison Grant, who'd been working tirelessly for years to convince Americans to do something to preserve the supposed racial purity of the United States. Progressivism wasn't just a social movement, a movement working the hearts and minds of Americans and changing the way in which they felt about things. It was also a political movement, um, a movement of politicians, who seek elective office and try to shape the policies of their communities, their states, or even the national government. Uh, Robert La Follette was one of uh, was a governor of Wisconsin, uh, becomes governor in 1900, and inspires progressive reformers uh, around the country with the kind of legislation he helped to encourage uh, within Wisconsin. Um, he increases corporate taxes. Uh, one thing that drove progressives like La Follette Bananas were these political machines. Uh, political machines worked in a sort of quid pro quo way. Um, a politician would hand out favors to supporters. Um, progressive reformers saw that as unscientific. They would prefer to have uh, skilled experts in bureaucratic positions, not people who gained those offices because they had the right connections. Um, one way that Robert La Follette tried to get around that was by creating a legislative library. Um, his feeling, and the feeling of other progressives, was that uh, a legislator without such a library, without a, a place to do research, uh, would inevitably have to return to their political bosses to figure out what kind of legislation should be passed. Uh, but if there were a legislative library, then that legislator could turn to the library, read what experts were saying, and form legislation based upon this kind of expert testimony. Uh, La Follette himself tended to recruit uh, various social experts from the University of Wisconsin to try and help uh, inform his policies. Uh, but perhaps the most infamous or famous <laughs> uh, progressive politician of the period um, is going to be Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt uh, remains the youngest president to hold the office, um, not the youngest elected president, that would be John F. Kennedy later, uh, but he became president when the president was assassinated. Um, in the election of 1900, he had been added to the presidential ticket with William McKinley, who was running for re-election. And um, when William McKinley was re-elected, very shortly after being re-inaugurated, uh, <clears throat> he was assassinated. And uh, shortly after assuming office, Teddy Roosevelt became president of the United States. Uh, this was a bit of a surprise to many of the Republicans uh, who had thought that the vice presidency would be a political dead end for Roosevelt. Roosevelt had been a popular, progressively-minded governor of New York, had been undersecretary of the Navy, 
uh, seem to be a politician on the make. And for more conservative-minded Republican politicians, they thought this was a way to sort of stifle his career, to uh, put him in the vice presidency, which many regarded as a political dead end. And there he would have the national attention that he seemed to be trying to gain, but also not have much to do. But all of a sudden, he does. Um, as we will see going forward, when we look at his policies, uh, he's very much a man of this progressive era, uh, re reflecting both, uh, I suppose, the more positive aspects to it, of trying to do something to improve the conditions of the working class and industrialization and the most impoverished parts of American cities, uh, but also reflecting the embrace of scientific racism that uh, many progressives similarly embraced. Um, he's going to exhibit those characteristics as well. So he exhibits all of the positives and negatives of progressivism um, during his presidency. Now, when he becomes president, uh, like many progressives, uh, it'd be hard to say Roosevelt was from the middle class. Uh, he was a very affluent and wealthy individual. Um, he came from a sort of very elite group of people in New York, uh, most of whom frowned on uh, participation in politics as sort of beneath their social class, but this was uh, very much what Teddy Roosevelt wanted to do with his life. And when he became president, he advocated for what became known as the Square Deal. Uh, Roosevelt billed himself as, as no enemy to business. Uh, that he thought uh, corporate America, business, these were all great things that made America better. Uh, but he also became an advocate for what he called the strenuous life. And for him, that meant both physically strenuous, uh, that one should be an active person. Um, Teddy Roosevelt's going to install a boxing ring in the White House. Um, he actually is going to become blinded in one eye when he was president because uh, he was in a sparring match with a partner, and uh, he got hit in the eye and his partner blinded him. Um, after that, he decided he should take it a little bit easier. Uh, but Roosevelt himself embodied this kind of physically active spirit uh, that he tended to suggest when he talked about the strenuous life. Uh, but when he talked about the strenuous life, he also meant the spirit of business competition, uh, that businesses that competed tended to make things better for all Americans. Uh, businesses that competed... Um, drove down prices for consumers uh, because they were trying to outdo one another. Businesses that competed had to continually improve themselves to offer a better product than their co uh, competitors. Uh, businesses that competed had to compete for workers and potentially offer better uh, uh, wages for workers. Uh, what Roosevelt didn't like is when businesses no longer competed. Uh, this problem of monopolization was a problem that uh, Teddy Roosevelt was going to address uh, during his presidency. Very early on in his presidency, Teddy Roosevelt's going to have to deal with this uh, coal strike uh, that breaks out. Uh, what happens is coal workers were angry. Uh, they wanted better wages, better working conditions. Uh, the coal owners, the owners of the mines, uh, refused to even recognize the union, much less meet with them. Um, and it seemed likely that the nation was going to be going without coal in the winter of 1902. Uh, now, in this day and age, most homes were heated with coal. Um, and so this coal strike could potentially mean that people are going to go cold um, and they weren't going to be able to heat their homes anymore. Uh, Roosevelt is going to step in and act as an arbiter between the labor uh, unionists, um, although he's not technically going to, to put any of them on the, on the board. But, but anyway, he's going to advocate between the labor unionists, the United Mine Workers, and the mine owners. Um, and in this, he's going to transform the position of the presidency uh, from what it had been in earlier decades. Um, after the presidency, and actually during the presidency of Andrew Johnson, uh, the presidency becomes reduced in its political importance. Um, in general, a number of placeholders take the office, but don't really use the presidency like we would think of the president today. You know, today when we think of who's going to be next to the president of the United States, we think of all sorts of policies. You know, what's your education policy? What's your, your policy regarding tariffs? All sorts of things. Uh, but back at the late 19th century, presidents were largely placeholders and not active reformers themselves. Teddy Roosevelt is going to transform that, and you can start to see some of that in the place that he uses the presidency in 1902. Uh, one detractor who was suggesting he was um, going beyond anything presented in the Constitution regarding the presidency uh, responded back that uh, he had to do it, that the Constitution was not... 
uh, written so that the people would have to obey the Constitution, but that the Constitution was instead written so that it would make the lives of Americans better. And gosh darn it, he was going to make sure that Americans had coal to heat their homes in the wintertime. Uh, his, his place within the coal strike, his threat to nationalize the mines if the mine owners didn't um, agree to let him work with them resulted in a 10% wage increase, uh, fewer working hours per day. Uh, the mine owners also claimed some victories, I suppose. They, they continued to uh, not recognize the uh, mine labor organizations that purported to represent the interests of the workers. But uh, uh, the overall effect is that Roosevelt is seen as somebody who's willing to take on big business, who's somebody who's going to use the presidency to... Um, resist the immense power that these uh, uh, controllers of capital um, had managed to gain for themselves um, in the business world. One of the more famous ways that uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt is going to use the presidency to uh, try and control the excesses of business um, is going to be through uh, trust busting or trust breaking. Uh, trust is a rather old-fashioned word uh, that means uh, a monopoly. Um, in the late 19th century, not just individual businesses, but people like J.P. Morgan uh, would try to combine businesses together to try and reduce competition. Uh, J.P. Morgan in the late 19th century, uh, his name still applied to you know, banking interests in the United States. Uh, he was a prominent banker uh, in the late 19th century, an incredibly wealthy individual. Um, he looked at the railroads in the late 19th century and reflected at how ruinous this competition really was, uh, that it tended to force railroads to adopt practices that were not beneficial to their bottom line. And so he put forward a number of plans to try and consolidate the railroad industries. And in 1904, Teddy Roosevelt files a lawsuit or instructs his administration to file a lawsuit um, against one of J.P. Morgan's securities, one of the consolidated railroad companies that combines a bunch of smaller companies together into one big firm, uh, the Northern Securities Company. Um, it controlled most of the rail traffic in the uh, northwestern portion of the United States, and uh, the Roosevelt administration sues, and they eventually win. Um, the Supreme Court responds by breaking it up, uh, literally chopping up the uh, this one consolidated firm into smaller companies. Uh, now, thinking back up to Teddy Roosevelt's square deal, you can understand why this might be appealing to him. Uh, that for the square deal, competition is at the center of what Teddy Roosevelt understands to be a good business practice. It tends to benefit lots of Americans. Americans ought to be, have, ought to be able to um, have a fair chance at success. And competition ensures that potentially if you work hard, and you struggle, you live this strenuous life that you might actually be able to be successful. Um, as long as we have monopolies, they're going to stifle competition, uh, not allow good ideas to succeed, and tend to uh, um, uh, inhibit the strenuous life. One example of that is the kind of immense power that this company Standard Oil had by the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Standard Oil controlled most of the refined oil in the United States, um, and they tended to use this immense power to stifle competition. Uh, one way they did that is by the kind of contracts they wrote with railroad companies. Uh, you can imagine every railroad company in the country is going to want to get the Standard Oil contract because it's going to mean a lot of money. Um, Standard Oil is going to be shipping a lot of oil, and that means a lot of money. Um, and so what they tended to do is say, well, you can have this contract and we'll use your rail line for our business, but you're not allowed to work with any of our competitors. Um, now, because of that, Railroad companies tended to not be willing to even begin negotiating with smaller oil companies that wanted to break into the business. It even got to the point where um, oil companies that were not standard oil, that wanted to compete, uh, were forced to create their own pipelines. And when they got to a railroad crossing, uh, they actually had to create a cap. And there are these pictures of, of trucks and wagon carts uh, filling up with oil on one side hauling it over the rail line and dumping it into the other side because the railroad company would not allow the pipelines to have access under the tracks. Um, it's this kind of, of stifling of competition that Roosevelt tends to be annoyed with um, and inspires him to uh, file these lawsuits against these trusts that seem to be engaging in unfair business practices that hurt consumers, hurt laborers, and 
I mean, <laughs> hurt smaller businesses that might have great ideas and be beneficial, but can't even break in and, and start competing because of these uh, business practices of these monopolies. Now, Roosevelt probably becomes most famous as a trust buster, uh, but in general, he didn't really like to use trust busting as a tool. Um, it relied upon the courts. The courts could be unpredictable in how they would rule upon things. Um, so in general, Roosevelt, during his two terms in office, uh, preferred to use regulation. Um, one of them you're going to be reading about in After the Fact for this week. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the Meat Inspection Act represents one of Teddy Roosevelt's crowning achievements, as he often billed it, uh, to regulate the meatpacking industry. Um, you'll see kind of the flaws of the Meatpacking Act and, and why it's there when you read through after the fact. Um, another example of that is the Railway Act, the Hepburn Railway Act of 1906. Uh, for many decades, if you remember back to the populist era of the late 19th century, uh, rural Americans had been calling for the government to do something to regulate railroads, that they were annoyed at the kind of fares railroads charged. There seemed to be no limits upon what they could charge. Uh, the populists sometimes suggested that perhaps the best route was to um, actually nationalize the railroads. Oh my. Wait, what? But the Hepburn Railway Act also highlights the limits of the kind of reform that uh, the progressives were offering. Um, the goal of trust busting and things like the National Securities Company um, was to create competition. Uh, but one could argue that things like the Hepburn Act, uh, which were passed under Teddy Roosevelt's administration, uh, created a sort of new centralizing power in the government uh, that created a sort of even playing field between railroads. Uh, so if there's a sort of maximum fare that railroads can charge and the Interstate Commerce Commission um, has the power to set fares for the railroads, uh, railroads don't necessarily dislike that all the time uh, because it means there's a sort of uniformity that is provided by the government uh, in the absence of a railroad monopoly uh, that can provide that kind of uniformity. Uh, so as we'll see in your reading from after the fact, a lot of these regulations will look at and say, you know, maybe a net positive, uh, maybe it does something to improve the conditions of meatpacking workers and consumers eating processed meats. Uh, maybe the Railway Act does something to benefit uh, people using the railroads. Uh, but we'll see that a lot of these policies are, at least in some respects, shaped by the companies and and. Uh, firms that are supposed to be regulated uh, by these, these new laws. Now, when it comes to foreign policy, Roosevelt was a big admirer. Now, Roosevelt was also an advocate for the Navy. Um, as Undersecretary of the Navy, he had been an avid reader. Um, he was quite a scholar himself, wrote multiple books, um, and he was very familiar with the ideas of Alfred Thayer Mahan, who you may remember from our uh, section on imperialism. Uh, in the United States. Um, and like Mahan, he thought that the U.S. needed to take a stronger hand internationally to control the nation, the world's shipping lanes. Um, in particular, Roosevelt looked towards the Caribbean and understood the Western Hemisphere to be a unique American sphere of influence. Um, Roosevelt tended to regard the world as divided between what he called civilization and chaos. And by civilization, he meant the United States and the countries of Western Europe. Uh, chaos, he meant everybody else. Uh, the other nations of the world that he regarded as not having approached the level of civilization exhibited by the Western European states or the United States. Um, and as a result, he thought it was the uh, um, necessity of commerce, of good rule, uh, that the United States take a direct hand in shaping the destinies of the countries in the Western Hemisphere. And as a result, Roosevelt adds this addendum to this old uh, uh, executive principle of the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine, issued way back in the 18-teens uh, by James Monroe, President of the United States at the time, uh, suggested that the U.S. would protect the independence of the newly emerging independent republics of the Western Hemisphere. Um, as the Spanish Empire crumbled, uh, 
uh, the United States would ensure, he said, uh, really the United States had no power to do something like that, but he, that's what the claim was, that the U.S. would ensure the independence of these new republics. Uh, Roosevelt accepts that, but he adds this addendum that the U.S. reserves the power to intervene in the affairs of Latin American states um, if it deems necessary, uh, which generally gives Latin American republics the impression that the United States is this bully from the north, uh, that on when needed, if there's a, an attempt to nationalize the United Fruit Company interests in, say, Nicaragua, uh, the U.S. might send in the Marines and occupy the nation for a period of time. Um, in particular, this comes to great importance when it, when it means this Panama Canal. Now, Roosevelt, being an admirer of Mahan, thinks it's absolutely vital to the interests, not just of the United States, but as Roosevelt frames it, civilization itself that there be a Panama Canal across the Isthmus of Panama. Uh, the problem was that uh, for decades at this point, a French firm had been trying with no success to build a canal across the Isthmus of Panama. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt wanted the U.S. to be able to take control of that interest and uh, run it itself. Uh, Panama at the time was part of the nation of Colombia. And uh, when the um, uh, treaty to try and allow a, the U.S. to build the Panama Canal was put forward before the Colombian legislature, they said no. Uh, Roosevelt was incensed and essentially gave the green light for Panamanian rebels to revolt against Colombia with the sort of uh, wink and nod agreement. Uh, Roosevelt couldn't say anything explicitly because that would you know, be a perhaps an act of war against Colombia, but uh, tacitly agreed to provide aid to the Panamanian rebels should they go ahead and decide to declare independence. Uh, shortly after, uh, a representative of the French firm who had close ties to these rebels uh, came back to Panama, lo and behold, uh, the Panamanian rebels launched their bid for independence. And lo and behold, uh, the U.S. sent what was known as the Great White Fleet, uh, because of the color of their hulls, uh, down to the coast of Panama to prevent the Colombian army from putting down the rebellion. And to no one's surprise, when the Panamanians declared independence, the U.S. was one of the first nations to recognize the independence of the newly minted Panama. And one of the first acts of the Panamanian legislature was to grant the U.S. permission uh, and title to the land uh, where the Panama, uh, Panama Canal would be constructed. Uh, Roosevelt, for him, the Panama Canal became his pet project. Uh, Roosevelt became the first president of the United States to leave the country while in office and visit a foreign country. And the foreign country that Roosevelt visited was the nation of Panama. Uh, so he could oversee the construction of the Panama Canal, which he considered to be a vital interest uh, for the United States. Now, Roosevelt, when he was reelected in uh, 19... Or, I'm sorry, when he was reelected in 1904... Uh, he promised not to seek re-election in 1908. Um, it was a promise that he would later regret, but he decided to stick with it and not seek re-nomination for the presidency in 1908. Uh, but he's popular enough that he's able to sway the Republican Party to back his good friend William Howard Taft. Uh, Taft receives the nomination, in some ways continues the progressive legacy of Roosevelt, um, one could make the argument that Taft was a better trust buster than Roosevelt was, and the sheer number of firms that were broken up under Taft's presidency was greater than had been broken up under Roosevelt's presidency. Uh, but in general, he's perceived to be out of touch with the progressive wing of the Republican Party. And... Uh, <clears throat> um, one of the things that... Uh, um, isolates him from progressives around the country is Taft's eventual support for the Payne Aldrich tariff. It wasn't necessarily something that fit his purposes exactly, but he did sign it into law. Uh, for progressives, they regarded the Payne Aldrich tariff as a symbol for the way Congress was in the pocket of the lobbyists of the big corporate interests. Uh, they believe, many progressives believe that uh, many of the biggest corporations hired individuals because of the vast sums of money they controlled uh, to go to Congress and lobby for legislation that would protect their industries. And so in general, progressives were opposed to tariffs, uh, which were taxes on foreign imported goods, uh, because they thought that this was giving an unfair advantage to these big corporations within the United States. 
Uh, so one of the problems for Taft is his support for this tariff, which generally erodes any progressive support that he had left for him uh, within the Republican Party. Um, like I said, it's a bit of an unfair characterization, though. Uh, Taft himself regarded himself as a progressive, is, is somewhat unfairly cast into the camp of the conservatives within the Republican Party. Taft himself did not enjoy the limelight that came with the presidency like Roosevelt did. Uh, Roosevelt understood how to manipulate the press. He loved the way that he was made of this sort of cartoonish character in uh, these political cartoons. And adopted that personality in real life, too. Uh, Taft, on the other hand, preserved, preferred uh, the quiet uh, policymaking of government uh, offices and not the public displays in front of the press. Um, in general, he had quite a miserable presidency. Um, his wife died shortly before he assumed office. Uh, he gained a lot of weight while he was president, uh, quite famously. Um, his doctors actually gave him a pretty good idea of how to lose weight. Uh, they prescribed a diet largely of fish and of vegetables and fruit, uh, things that doctors would probably prescribe to overweight patients today who are trying to lose weight. Uh, but Taft, like overweight patients today, generally complained about feeling hungry all the time. Um, and so he would lose weight but gain it back uh, in the way that uh, people trying to lose weight today often gain it but lose it back, or lose it but then gain it back. In um, 1912, Roosevelt came back and decided to re-seek the nomination for president within the Republican Party. Um, it didn't work out for him. Uh, Taft felt quite hurt. Roosevelt said a number of negative things about him in the press, um, and Taft was still popular enough to be able to um, get the nomination within the Republican Party. Uh, because of that, however, uh, many of the progressives walked uh, from the, Repub the Republican nominating convention and joined with Roosevelt in creating a new political party, uh, the Progressive Party, sometimes referred to as the Bull Moose Party. Uh, this is a picture, supposedly, of uh, Teddy Roosevelt riding a moose. Um, if you look closely, you can tell it's a doctored image. Uh, it's not exactly a deep fake, as we would call it today, that uh, this is basic clip art. Uh, a picture of Teddy Roosevelt riding a horse was cut out and he was pasted on top of a moose. Um, in general, you don't want to ride a moose. Moose are some of the most dangerous animals in North America today. Uh, they tend to be a bit um, um, restless and will be prone to attack. Uh, but anyway, uh, the party that he forms, the Progressive Party, um, it's sometimes called the Bull Moose Party. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt, for his part, uh, comes up with a new campaign platform that he calls New Nationalism. And new nationalism suggests that the sort of big businesses, big corporations are an inevitable part of the American economy. That this is just going to happen, uh, that it's idealistic and naive to think that we can return to these simpler times of small businesses. And he says what the national government needs to do, because this is inevitable, is to adopt a stronger hand in controlling that economy. Uh, as a result of that, he tends to go further in the lead up to the election of 1912 than he was willing to go during his own presidency. Um, he suggests things occasionally like perhaps it might be necessary to nationalize the railroads, which is going way beyond anything that uh, he was suggesting uh, while he was president. Certainly regulation of the railroads while he was president, but uh, the, the suggestion that if the railroads aren't going to accept the controlling hand of the government, it might be necessary to nationalize them is... Uh, going a step further than anything Roosevelt had um, in mind before. For the Democrats, they're going to nominate Woodrow Wilson for president. And Wilson, like Roosevelt, was regarded as a progressive. Uh, the progressive movement was not contained within one party or, or the other, uh, but rather was uh, a movement of reform that had members in both the Democratic and Republican parties. And as a progressive politician, um, he had been a short-term governor of New Jersey before he was nominated for president of the United States. Um, he, he had instituted a number of reforms in New Jersey. And in general, his new freedom platform, as he calls it, tends to suggest that Roosevelt's going too far. Uh, Wilson argues that what we need are policies that are going to continue that earlier progressive tradition of uh, scaling back on the large scale of incorporations. Uh, to allow for the survival of small businesses, to provide the kind of regulations that will create a sort of even playing field. Uh, 
Um, in one of his speeches about new freedom, he talks about liberty as being a sort of well-oiled machine. Uh, he says, we think of a machine as running freely uh, when all the parts are running smoothly, everything is well-oiled and greased. And he tends to suggest that, that should be the role of the government, to be the greaser, to be the oiler, to make sure the machine is running smoothly. And in general, he tends to suggest that Roosevelt's going too far. Um, in his plan for new nationalism, he's going well beyond anything that uh, was advisable for the United States. For his part, Teddy Roosevelt tends to suggest new freedom as a sort of naive uh, glimpse into the past, that the kind of small businesses Woodrow Wilson wants to support are just not a reality anymore. We live in a new world, that kind of an economy is gone, uh, we need to accept the reality of things and adopt policies that will accept bigness in the American economy and uh, not try to return to a past that is just not recoverable. In the 1912 election, um, it looks like a landslide victory for Woodrow Wilson, but what essentially happened is the Republicans divided between themselves and handed the election over to the Democratic Party. Uh, so if you look closely at the popular vote, you'll notice that combined, Teddy Roosevelt and uh, Taft got more than 50% of the popular vote. Uh, Woodrow Wilson is launched into the presidency having received only 42% of the popular vote, even though he got 82% of the Electoral College. Um, and yeah. Now, during his presidency, Woodrow Wilson is going to get, at the very least, an, an amazing amount of legislation passed. A lot of it is still influencing the national government today and our economy today. Um, shortly after taking office, one of the things that Wilson pushes through Congress, uh, the Senate was actually pretty reluctant to pass it, but uh, Wilson kind of shamed the Senate. Um, he launched this campaign of, of uh, suggesting that a number of senators were on, on the take from big businesses and thus willing to allow uh, these kind of tariffs to be uh, coming into existence. Uh, this seemed to have worked its magic and got the Senate to actually create a tariff that was even lower than what the House had given them. Uh, Woodrow Wilson happily signed the thing in the, into law, and you can see on the slide in front of you uh, that the Underwood-Simmons tariff dramatically lowered uh, the tariff rates from what they had been before he took office, much to the delight of progressives around the country who saw this as a clear sign that Wilson uh, was going to keep large businesses and corporations from having undue influence over Congress. Um, under his presidency, we also see the ratification of the 16th Amendment, which was a, a sort of progressive um, desire. Uh, the 16th Amendment allows for the creation of a national income tax. Uh, before that, we didn't have an income tax. There was an attempt to create one. Um, it was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, and so the way around that is to change the Constitution. Uh, the Supreme Court can't declare part of the Constitution unconstitutional because it's the Constitution. So the ratification of the 16th Amendment is seen as a fairer way to generate income for the national government from some of the earlier forms of taxation. Uh, because the income tax can be graduated by income. So people who earn more uh, can pay a larger percentage of their income uh, towards taxes than people who earn less. It's different than things like tariffs, which tend to impact people in the same way. Uh, it, tariffs on, on goods coming into the country will have the tendency to increase the price of consumer goods, and whether you're making uh, an income below poverty or you're one of the titans of industry, you pay the same rate, uh, regardless of how much you make. So income tax is seen as a fairer way to collect money and revenue for the national government uh, that allows people who earn more to pay more and people who earn less to pay less. There are a number of other things too that the Wilson administration does uh, that has a tendency to um, improve the regulatory powers of the national government over the economy. Uh, one of them is the Clayton Antitrust Act, uh, which is essentially a revision of the Sherman Antitrust Act and in some ways uh, creates a little bit more clarity um, in the Sherman Antitrust Act. It makes clearer, for example, that the Sherman Antitrust Act should not be applied to union groups um, who are trying to uh, improve the, the lot of their members um, and was supposed to be applied towards industry. Um, it makes illegal things like uh, companies intentionally uh, selling products at a loss with the goal of destroying their competition uh, so that they can then um, dominate the industry. Uh, those kind of practices become illegal under the Clayton Antitrust Act. Um, under Wilson as well, the government has a tendency to take on more um, 
powers that are intended to prevent problems from happening in the first place. Uh, so the Federal Trade Commission um, takes as its principle that it's going to, before it approves mergers, um, let businesses know whether this is going to potentially violate the Clayton Antitrust Act, that the government intends to sue if these businesses do, in fact, buy each other out and become one big company. Um, so we see the government in some ways, ironically enough, take on the kind of prescriptive controlling activities that uh, Roosevelt proposed when he was running for office in 1912. Um, another big program or office that's created under Wilson that still impacts uh, American politics today is the Federal Reserve Act, which creates what we call today the Fed. Um, it's the federal board. Actually, there are boards all over the country, but we, we tend to focus on the, the national board in D.C., and essentially what this Fed does is it controls interest rates around the country, and it does that by um, issuing amounts of money to banks. Um, the reason this is important is the Fed is supposed to be there to smooth out the boom and bust cycle of the economy. Um, a lot of progressives realized that um, we tend to go through cycles in the American economy. You have periods of just exponential growth uh, when more and more products are being created, unemployment's at essentially zero, but then you hit a speculative bubble. Um, and the bubble pops and unemployment rises dramatically, the amount being produced declines dramatically, and for a lot of progressives, this just seemed kind of a silly cycle that the American economy tended to go through every 15, 20 years. Um, and the Fed is designed to smooth out that boom and bust cycle of the economy. Uh, so what the Fed is supposed to do is when the economy is doing really well, businesses are growing, more products are being created, uh, the Fed is supposed to raise interest rates, which tends to encourage consumers and, and businesses to put their money into safer products, things that, products that are less prone to speculative bubbles, things like government bonds, for example, or um, hard specie, things, things that are seen as, as, as safer. Um, this is designed to discourage people from uh, pumping up the bubble. Uh, there's something that is of more value than people think it is out there, and uh, people keep buying into it, and they take out risky loans to get it, um, and then the bubble pops and people lose a lot of money. Uh, so if we can discourage people from taking out as many loans for risky business ventures, then maybe the bubble won't grow so big, is the idea behind it. Uh, now, when those bubbles do inevitably pop, the Fed Reserve is supposed to lower interest rates to encourage people to go out there and start up new businesses. Um, and the goal is to smooth out that boom and bust cycle. So if we have general growth over time, um, instead of having dramatic growth and dramatic declines, we'll have reasonable growth and less dramatic declines uh, is the goal of the Fed Reserve. Um, and of course, it's still influencing us today. The Fed today um, still influences the interest rates that you pay when you go to buy a house or you go to buy a car. Um, so the Fed is still with us today and it's still intended to serve the same kind of function. Um, you'll notice today we're sort of in periods of, of a pretty decent growth in 2019. Um, and so the Fed has a tendency to want to raise interest rates. Um, it's been a little reluctant to ra raise it too quickly, but um, in general, as it tries to gauge the strength of the American economy, if it sees it growing and sees unemployment at near zero, the tendency is to want to raise interest rates to kind of calm things down. Now, one of the impacts of the progressive era as a whole is that the federal government grows in size, the number of people who are actually working directly for the national government. Um, and if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense. Um, as people called upon the national government to provide various regulations, uh, whether it's regulating the meatpacking industry and hiring more meat inspectors, whether it's local governments uh, that are hiring inspectors of buildings, uh, as the governments are taking on more regulatory responsibilities, you're going to have to hire more regulators. Um, and as a result, you can see on the chart in front of you, the total number of people who are working for the federal government uh, dramatically grows over this progressive period of time as the government takes on more and more regulatory powers and has to hire people uh, who are going to provide that kind of regulation. Now, 1916 is another campaign year. Uh, the Republican nominee is influenced by Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt desperately wanted to get the U.S. into this war that had been waging in Europe now for four, two years. 
Um, Wilson campaigned on the promise that he was going to keep the United States out of the war. Um, he won in a fairly close election, and that would seem to suggest most Americans in 1916 wanted to keep the United States out of the war. Um, again, one of those big ironies, though, is that the next year, after having won re-election in 1916, promising to keep the peace and not to bring the U.S. into war, um, in April of the next year, in 1917, Wilson is going to Congress, asking Congress to give him a declaration of war. And that's going to be the focus in the next series of, of, uh, of pages you're going to be looking at here. Um, the actual war that's taking place, where the war came from, why it existed, and how it's going to shape the United States at home is going to be the particular focus of those pages.